Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you in the Lord's house today. That's a good sentiment, isn't it? But forget about us and concentrate on the Lord God Almighty. It's good to see you here today. Glad you guys are here. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, shall we? Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to come before you this day and tell you that we love you and we're so grateful and so happy to belong to you and be in your house, Lord. Thank you for the blessings of the week. Thank you for uh, all the reminders of all the great and wonderful things we have to be thankful for. Thank you for, uh, Lord, our friends and family and the air to breathe and for our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by whom our soul is saved, sins are forgiven, and eternity in heaven is secured. We pray, O oh Lord God, your blessings on our services this day. It's for your, and your honor and your glory. Be pleased, Lord, and, uh, and uh, just bless us with your holy presence. We couldn't ask for anything more. We love you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' magnificent and eternal name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Smile at each other and say hi for a second on the way down. There you go. Good to see everybody here. Glad you made it. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful time of year. And uh, doesn't the sanctuary look nice? The Christmas tree and all the decorations? Yeah. We appreciate the team that does that. Uh, Linda and Philip Smith and Mary Campbell and Karen Kincaid and probably some others as well. They do a good job and it looks all very festive in here. It makes me happy. It make you happy? All right. Well, me too. And uh, the other uh, thing to mention is that this is um, our month for our Lottie Moon um, emphasis. Uh, we pray for our foreign missionaries. We take up a special offering for foreign missions. We are uh, blessed to be able to reach into all kind of foreign countries and, pre and bring the gospel presented uh, in, in their own language teach and train and raise up um, native missionaries wherever they're from they can reach their own people and a great number of uh, of ministries that you and i get to be a part of not only by the offerings that we give but also by uh, being aware of it and praying for them and uh, asking the lord's blessings on each one so this morning we have our lottie moon video we're going to show right now to give you an idea of it From the Great Commission in Matthew 28 until the Great Multitude in Revelation 7, God invites us to join Him in the Great Pursuit. In a world filled with diverse cultures, languages, and people, we are unified in this mission, His mission. Since 1845, IMB missionaries have embarked on a journey to share the gospel, make disciples, and plant churches in places where Jesus is not yet known. But the task is monumental. Billions are still unreached, living without the hope and love of Christ. In 2023, over 879,000 people heard the gospel, 141,000 people believed, and 116,000 were baptized. Yet so many more still wait for their chance to hear and believe. Lostness is not just a statistic. It's an eternal reality for billions of souls. But amidst the challenges, there's hope. The Great Pursuit is a faithful journey fueled by love, compassion, and the unwavering belief in the transformative power of the gospel. Stories of redemption, reconciliation, and restoration inspire us to press on. Our vision is rooted in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 a multitude from every corner of the world united in worshiping Jesus Christ. You are called to play your part in this vision. Whether you pray fervently, give generously, go boldly or send faithfully, your role is vital in the great pursuit. Join us in solving the greatest problem in the world, lostness. Together, we spread the message of hope and salvation to every nation, tribe, and tongue. This is The Great Pursuit. You remember when you were lost without Jesus? You remember that? Like that for? And you remember the time there were churches on every corner? There were TV programs, radio programs. You knew a bunch of Christians, and you knew somebody was praying for you probably, didn't you? Yeah, me too. Most of the world is not that way. There are whole nations where they're precious little uh, representation of the gospel. Few Christians, if any, 
they're having a hard time. And it is our responsibility as their brothers and sisters in Christ to honor them with our prayers and do all that we can to help them as they try to serve the Lord. And all these millions and millions of lost souls that do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what breaks the heart of God, and that's what breaks our hearts as well. Amen? Let's have another word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord's blessings on our, on our missions efforts. Lord God Almighty, we want to say again thank you for, um, for our own salvation. Thank you, Lord, that we were brought up in a country where the gospel was so prevalent that we had uh, multitudes of opportunities to hear and to respond. And Lord, remind us that it's not that way in most parts of the world. And Lord, we pray for those precious souls, everyone for whom Jesus Christ has died and the gospel is theirs, Lord, but they just haven't heard it. We pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, whatever language they speak, whatever color of their skin or culture they're from, Lord. We pray, Lord, your very richest blessings upon the family of God, wherever it may be found, that be courage and strength and blessings and protection, Lord God. And Lord, we pray for our efforts as we try to reach more and more lost souls for you. Thank you for our missionaries. Thank you for our ministries that, uh, that, that transmit the gospel in the countries where missionaries aren't even allowed. And Lord, we just trust that you are still sovereign, holy, and almighty, that you're going to bring a great salvation of souls, Lord, because that's just what you do. And we want to thank you that we've been the recipient, that we get to pass the torch, Lord, to others in the next generation. We love you, and we praise you in Jesus' holy and almighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank God for your salvation. Brother Dennis is going to come help us sing some more. It's going to be good.
have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for these wonderful songs that, that praise you, Lord. That's why we're here, to lift you up. And Father, we thank you that, that you saw the need, Father, to, to come to us, Father. Thank you for that. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for dying for us, Father. And we thank you for the reason for this season, Lord. We just want to say we love you this morning. And, Father, we just pray for Brother Johnny as he comes proclaim your word this morning, Father. And you can hide it, uh, his words, your words in our hearts, Father. Father, keep us safe during this season. And, Lord, may our eyes be set on you throughout this whole season, Father, that we'll love you. And, and we just uh, recognize you as who you are. Forgive us, Lord, in our sins and Lord we just give you praise glory and honor in the name of Jesus amen amen good morning again I love the Christmas season don't you don't you like Christmas yeah I like I like Thanksgiving a little bit too much I think but uh, I like Christmas season, and uh, we'll be talking about Christmas probably the rest of the month, but not today. Not today. We're going to talk about why it was so important that Christ came in the first place. And our uh, our uh, sermon this morning is about the writing on the wall. You remember that? Remember this uh, that story, that Bible story? The old wicked king saw the writing on the wall. We're going to talk about that this morning. Stay with me for the reading of the Word of God. You've been up and down a lot, so if your knees don't want to get up, that's fine, okay? You just be standing up on the inside with this for the Word of God, okay? Proud of Daniel chapter 5. It's not all the verses, but there's enough to get our, our storyline here, okay? Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine... Belshazzar gave the commandment to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. And they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in the Jerusalem and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who was one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you should be clothed with purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing of the king, and make known to him the interpretation. Verse 23. You have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. They brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Now, I'm going to pronounce these ancient Chaldean words, and it has nothing to do with how it really was, okay? All right. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Perez. Who knows what, okay? And this is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, 
Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command. They clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Let's pray. Almighty God, again, we, we come and humble ourselves before the mighty throne of God, that you're still God of gods and ruler over all things. Lord, we want to thank you that you're still the God, and uh, our breath rests in your hands, and all our times are determined by you, that you haven't lost any strength or power or sovereignty, Lord, that you still are the one true living, the only God of gods. And we love you, and we thank you. We're so happy to belong to you. Fill me now with your spirit to bring a message of your honor and your glory, for you and you alone are worthy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our beloved Savior and Lord, we all pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Belshazzar, Belshazzar wasn't much of a king, and the, uh, the Medes and the Persians were going to take over the world. This is a, a changing of the, uh, of the empires of, of the world back in the day. So uh, the, the army of the Medes and Persians were outside the city of Babylon. Babylon is this massive city, great big walls, and they, I mean, it was a fortress, okay? Nobody could get in. And, uh, and so the army was uh, upriver a little bit, because the river Euphrates ran right through the middle of the city. And so what they did was by hand, they dug a canal from the Euphrates River over to a marshy area and they're going to divert the entire Euphrates River over into the marshlands. And it's going to drop the level of the river. And they're just going to walk in the riverbed and take the city. Because meanwhile, inside the, the walled city, the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines, all the nobilities were having a party. And the whole city was having one of their uh, Babylonian feasts known for its debauchery and wickedness and everything, every way that you can uh, uh, sin against God, they did it, okay? So everybody's throwing this big, massive party inside the, the city of Babylon. And Belshazzar says, bring me those gold and silver vessels that we got from that temple over there. And he's drinking his wine and all these things, and the hand, the fingers of the hand sent from God wrote a message specifically to him. Your kingdom has been taken away from you. It's been numbered. The, the words mean numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. That's what the words mean. And Daniel's going to have to interpret this. But the one in the middle is what we want to talk about. God says to this man, this king, I mean, he's one, look, one minute you're the ruler of the world, the next minute you're dead standing before God. And the middle word that he said about him was this, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Now the thing about Belshazzar is he's just not that different from a lot of people in this world. Yeah, he's ancient and he's back in the days of the Babylonian kingdom and all these things, but he had the same common problem that plagues so much of humanity. And it's this, he had taken the things, the holy things of God, and he used them to honor himself. And in the process, he dishonored God. He took the holy things of God, honored himself, thereby dishonoring God, in whose hand his breath laid. And all his times, times of his life, his birth, his enthronement, his crowning, his all it, and the time of his death, God had all that in, in his hand. Now, it's, it's easy in this world to be carried away with our own ego. It is part of the human condition that we think that we are very, very important. That who I am and what I want and what I've done and what I've accomplished is, is wonderful, it's great, I'm good, and uh, 
this thing about religion and God and all those things, that's fine for others, but you know, I'm looking out for me and I'm doing well and I'm just going to live my life and if I needed a little dose of religion, I'll get it somehow or another, you know, and put it on the front and be just fine. But deep in my heart, I'm telling you that there's a, there's a desire that we're going to raise up ourselves, we're going to be self-important and we're taking the holy things of God and raising up and honoring ourselves and by doing that, we dishonor God. A lot of people are just really self-important, would you not agree? We see them all the time. You know a bunch of them, okay? Now, it's easy to point our finger out there and say, oh, you're a bunch of, a bunch of wicked sinners, you know, and, and, and God's going to get you, and this is all true. But all those egotistical wicked sinners are not in church this morning with us, are they? And so it's not enough for me to say, oh, we're, gonna, we're just going to thank God. He's going to get the wicked. Listen, the Bible also says, when God punishes the wicked, don't you be glad of it. Because if you're glad of it, he'll quit. He'll stop. It will displease him. When you're happy that somebody else has problems, you say, oh, well, good, good enough for them. I'm glad. Get them, God. God says, no, I'm going to let them go. And I'll tell you why. Because the development of the, of the character of Christ and his people is more important than the sins of an unbelieving world. That's what he's after. Oh, he'll deal with sin. But if their wickedness and their, and their, and their punishment for it makes you happy, then that makes you not like Jesus. That makes you unmerciful and ungracious, that there's a spirit of hardness and judgment about you, which is nothing like the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you're happy, at the pain of some other person. Don't be surprised if God goes ahead and blesses them. And we say, well, why does God keep blessing wicked? Well, that, that may be one of the reasons right there. Because his kids are too glad about the problems of other people. And that's not what you're here for. Jesus never met a person he wouldn't die for. And so we have to look at these people with some sense of compassion. We also have to say, well, Lord, I see what you're saying to them. And I know this, it's, it's bad, it's rough. Well, this man's going to die that very night. But Lord, what are you saying to me as well? Because again, it's part of our human condition. We like to take the holy things of God and we like to honor ourselves with them. The holy things of God, your life, the image of God within you, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very breath that you breathe, God's goodness and his blessings to you, the sunshine, the rain, the food on your table, the clothes on your back, the roof over your head. The Bible says every good gift and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Everything good in your life is a gift from God. These are the holy things of God, and we take God's blessings, we take God's gift, and we use them for our own self-important purposes, and we honor ourselves with the gifts of God, and in so doing, we cut him out. And we dishonor the Lord. Now, I'll be the first to admit, old Belshazzar, he took it to the extreme, right? Right? He knew better, but he didn't do better. There's a section of scriptures that we, that we skipped over where Daniel told him about what God had done with his grandfather, whoever, Nebuchadnezzar, how that he was raised up in his pride and arrogance, and God made him insane for seven years. He lived out in the field turned into an animal, and then when he's, when his, when his, after seven years, his mind came back, and he's, now he's, oh, he's all about the Lord God then. And Daniel says, and you know what happened. You, you were there. You, you've heard the story. You know that these things happened, but you don't care. You know right, but you don't do right. You know there's a God, but you won't honor him because it's not expedient. It's not, it's not for your, it's not, doesn't feed your ego. It doesn't raise up your own sense of self-importance. You say, well, I'm a good person. Well, the world's full of good people, amen? Everybody I know is good. But listen to what he said. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. God said, I know everything you ever did, thought, said. I've got it all recorded. 
I've got all your deeds. I've got, I've got all, the, all the ways that I have, have blessed you and given to you and, 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 and raised you up. Well, I've made you king. This man's dad was supposed to be king, but he didn't want anything to do with him, so he lived in retirement somewhere else. Belshazzar is the king by the hand of God. And what an opportunity he had to actually do something good. But he probably built himself a big palace like they always do and threw a big feast like they always do. Because I'm big and I'm important and I've accomplished this and I'm proud of myself for that and I, I want this and I want people to think of me in such and such a way. And I'm going to think of others in such and such a way a little bit lower than me. And it's just part of the human condition. And we, if we're honest, we all can see a little bit of ourselves here in Belshazzar. Amen? Yeah. Don't we? Yeah. Don't we all struggle with a sense of self-importance? And are we not all guilty of taking the, the holy things of God and use them for our own benefit, honoring ourselves, and dishonoring God in the process? Now we say, well, is it really that big a deal? Well, the answer is yes. It is that big a deal. It's that big a deal for, uh, for those that are lost without, without Christ because God said, um, I'm, I'm, you're measured, you're weighed, you're judged, and you are the fulfillment of Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All the good people, all the popular people, all the wealthy people, all the ones who are celebrities and live at the top of the world, all the big smiling people, all the ones in charge, fall short of the glory of God. Weighed in the balance and they do not measure up. All the good folk out there that work hard and try hard and whatever, weighed in the balance and found wanting. You come up short. This is what God says is my standard. Now, these, these words are, have to do with weights and measures of, uh, of, of precious metals. Okay? Uh, it was... Uh, 50 shekels, 50 shekels, one shekel, half a shekel. Those are the words. And that's the way that they were applied in the, in the balances. You're going to do some business. Well, I need the, the shekel was the weight, not just the particular coin. So he's weighed in the balances, and there's, it's a money thing, and it's a value thing. And God says, on, on my side of the scale, here's what's required. And on your side of the scale, it's just not there. Is not enough. Insufficient funds. You're found wanting. You owe God more than you can pay. Now, it's not just that God is holy and, and that there's judgment day coming for all of us, although that's part of it. But I want you to understand we all have a scale. You get this in your mind. We, we're all placed in God's scale, Right? Right? We all come up short on by, all by ourselves, right? We all, also, we all have a scale. And we, uh, we judge one another, amen? Sometimes harshly, sometimes not. We judge ourselves, don't we? Yeah. yeah. There's a verse in the Bible that says, they measured themselves by themselves and compared themselves to themselves, and they were not wise. I'm looking, for a, I'm looking for a better standard than what I can cough up myself. But are you not also a child of God? Yes. And is there not also a desire in your heart to do the right thing by God? Do you not want to honor Christ more? Right? But again, part of the human condition that even the best of God's children, we still struggle with particular things, do we not? Over the book of Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says that we're supposed to lay aside the sin that which does so easily beset us. 
Everybody's got one or a handful. It's, you know, I mean, we all say, we know, well, yeah, we do that. Oh, but we all have character flaws. And everybody's got a little something, something that their, their, favorite, their favorite sin. Right? You don't have one? Well, God bless you. One of these days, I hope I'm as holy as, as I wish I were. So we all got these things. Now, one of the, and for God's children, listen, one of the ways, and seriously, we want to be more holy, do we not? We want to honor Christ more, don't we? We want to be better Christians, don't we? We want to please our Heavenly Father. We want to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to live a better life to, 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 to more greatly explain and proclaim how appreciative we are of His grace and His mercy. The Apostle Paul wrote about it in, in Romans chapter 7. He says, good things I want to do, I don't do them. Bad things that I don't want to do, I do them anyway. Because I see what I want to do, but I don't have the, whatever it takes, for some reason, I don't have the ability to do the good and ignore the bad. So, oh, a wretched man that I am, because it's like a back and forth, it's driving him nuts. Because he wants to be holy. He wants to be more pleasing to God. But old brother Paul, like all the rest of us, he had these besetting sins, and some of them are just hard to get rid of. So one of the things that we have to do is, is we have to fight that good fight. We have to get leverage on ourselves. Now, Jesus put it this way, again, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse, I think it's 5. He said, you have not yet struggled to the point of shedding blood, struggling against sin. The writer of Hebrews says sometimes it's, it's so hard that you've got to bleed. It's not just, well, I ought to not. It's a fight. It's a struggle. So one of the things you have to do is you have to get leverage on yourself. And I'm going to give you a little leverage here, okay? I want you to look at your favorite little sin, the way God looks at it. Now, God says, you've been weighed in my balance and been found wanting. You don't measure up. You're insufficient. You're not enough. And I reject you. Now, for someone who is outside the will of God, they have a scale, too. And the wicked, the wicked people, you know, whoever they are. Those who reject Christ, you know what they do? They are saying to Lord Jesus Christ, to all that he accomplished on the cross of Calvary, they're saying to Jesus, I have weighed you in my balance. And Jesus, I find you wanting lacking, insufficient, and I reject you. Now, this is the reason why rejecting Christ is such a horrible crime against God. It's not just, you know, chicken or beef. It's more than that. It's not just, well, thanks or no thanks. It's not just, well, I prefer not to be a Christian. It's not just like, well, maybe one of these days. It means that you have looked, looked at the cross of Calvary and all that God's only begotten Son paid on that cross, which is everything, not just his physical suffering and death, but he gave heaven, he gave his Father, he gave his angels, he gave his holiness and his purity. He shouldered the twin burdens of the sins of man and the wrath of God. He was beaten down so low, he was practically on the same footing as the devil. So that God Almighty, his Heavenly Father, turned his back and rejected him. And he gave all of that so you could have all the good things that come from being a child of God. And when you reject Jesus as your Savior, when you say, oh, none for me, or I'm not sure I believe that, or I never asked him to do it, it doesn't matter what your excuses are, and there are millions of excuses. But if you look at it from the perspective of the Heavenly Father, and he says, I'm going to give you 
my son and all that he did on the cross of Calvary for you. And you look at Jesus and you weigh him in your balance and you say, you know what? I find Christianity wanting and lacking and none for me. Christ, God, all that, you're found wanting. You're insufficient. I'm going to be in charge. I'm, on, I'm important. I'm heavy and weighty and glorious. And it's all about me. And I know what I'm doing. And that's all fine. It's mythological and good for the weak of mind or whatever it might be. But God Almighty looks at it and says, here's what you've done. You've taken my son and the cross of Calvary and you weighed him in your little balance and you've told my son that he's not good enough, that he's wanting, he's insufficient. Now stand before God on your judgment day and see what you get. Amen? Do you understand? You understand the importance. It's not just, well, I prefer not to. Oh, it is not the way God sees it at all. It's the difference between heaven and hell, life and death. And that's why they have to come to Christ as their Savior. They just have to. That's why Jesus said, you must, you must, you must be born again. But what's that got to do with me as a Christian? Huh? Well, it's got quite a bit because, see, I got my own little scale. We all got our little scales. We're always weighing and always judging and always deciding. And when you indulge yourself, when you're self-indulgent and self-important, when you decide that you're going to do what you want to do, and you cut God out of the picture, Here's what you do. You say you're a Christian. You say you love the Lord Jesus. You say you're holy. You say you're a child of God. You say you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And yet you, you, you weigh Christ and the cross and your profession of faith in the balance. And when no one's looking, when it's just you, you decide that at that time, at that moment, in that situation, Jesus Christ and the cross and the Holy Spirit and the love of God and all his countless blessings on you is not enough. It's insufficient. You find him wanting. Because I'm going to do what I want to do. My ego, myself, my self-importance. And I take the holy things of God and I honor myself with them. And I dishonor my beloved Savior. That's one of the ways we get leverage on ourselves. Because remember, we want to be better Christians. We want to do the right thing, whether anybody's looking or not. We all struggle the same way. God knows these things. It's not like you snuck around and God never knew, right? Oh, he knows. And he's... Keeping score, writing her down. So we get leverage against ourselves, our, our, our sinful nature, our ego. And we try to remember these things when the temptation comes and we say, you know what? If I do this thing, I guess about half so many times. This besetting sin. You got yours, I got mine. Nobody's business but yours. But at that moment at that time, I need to remember that it's not just a decision I make. It is a slap in the face of God Almighty, and it's calling the cross of Jesus insufficient. He's not enough right here, right now. He don't do it for me right here, right now. I got other plans, I got other wants, I got other desires right here, right now. And so for right now, wait in the balance. Jesus, you are insufficient to get me through this temptation. And when we learn that, when we practice that as a skill, let me tell you something, it'll rake your, your mind over the coals and it'll make you miserable and it will help you to get a hold of some of that stuff. Amen? Now, I didn't tell you all that to make you feel bad. You know, that's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He makes us feel bad. I tell you all that to give you a tool to help you in your pursuit of personal holiness before God because you want to take the holy things of God and you want to honor and glorify God with them and not honor and glorify yourself. Amen? Amen. That's the whole point. Now, back to Belshazzar while we have a minute. 
Belshazzar says, well, I'm going to keep my word in his drunken stupor. Oh, he's sober now, right? Yeah. And you know what it means that his uh, loins were loosed and his knees knocked, right? Yeah. And Daniel did his thing. And uh, the king said, fine, you know what? That's it. And put a royal robe on and put a gold necklace around him and proclaim him the third ruler of the kingdom. Okay. And all about that time, here's what happened. Out past the wall of Babylon, the Medes and Persians finished their canal. The river Euphrates was diverted off into a marshland. The water level of the river dropped. And a bunch of commandos walked down the riverbed underneath the wall into the city of Babylon. They went over to the main gate, overcame the guards, opened up the, the, the main gates, and the whole army just got to walk right in. They took the city of Babylon without a battle because everybody was drunk. A few skirmishes here and there, and that was it. They didn't even interrupt the parties. All the Babylonians woke up the next day and they got over their hangover and they said, wait, what? Oh, I'm not a Babylonian anymore. I'm a Mede, a Persian, apparently. But I'll tell you what they did do. They went out to the palace. They found King Belshazzar. And they killed him. He'd been weighed in balance and found wanting. Now you listen to me. This is very, very important. When Belshazzar got the message from God, your, your kingdom, your days are numbered, it's over, you weighed the balance and you're found wanting, and, and, and the kingdom's taken from you and divided, given to the Medes and the Persians, whoever else. Here's something that is not in that narrative, something that's missing. You ready for this? Belshazzar was not given an opportunity to repent. He's going to die that night, okay. But for Belshazzar, at this point, now you listen to me. At this point, the days of grace and mercy and forgiveness were over for him. Part of the human condition, we feel like we're going to live forever. Our head knows it, but our heart thinks, I'm going to live forever. Only we don't. And we think, well, one of these days I'm going to get right with God. When I, after I, you know, after I was it, sow our wild oats or whatever, after I do my thing, after I've got to have my fun first, and in one of these days, one of these days I'm going to get right with God. Oh, when I get old and feeble and frail, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get saved. Or maybe I'm a Christian that's fallen away from God and lived my own way for a long time. Well, yeah, but when I, when I get ready to die... I'm going to repent and change my ways. And God says, listen, your, your breath is in my hand and the, your times are in my hand. And it's not just your physical times of your, the day of your birth and the day of your death. It's also the times when God deals with you. The Bible says my Holy Spirit will not always deal with mankind. Dear friend, listen, we all have a deadline. We all have a deadline in this life. And if God is not dealing with you, you can't get saved. You won't do it. God said, listen, you don't come when I call you, then I don't come when you call me. Belshazzar had passed the deadline. And for him, there was no forgiveness, no mercy, no grace. The Bible says the same thing about uh, uh, Esau who sold his birthright. He sought repentance with tears after he did that stupid thing and sold it to Jacob. But it was to no avail. You have a deadline. People think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll live in rebellion against God all these years, and then after I have lived the habit, the ingrained habit of ignoring God, then we think that one day magically we'll just turn to God. 
Or oh, when I get that really, really bad news from the doctor, when, it's, when, when, I, when I see it coming, oh, then I'm going to be right. I'm going to get right with God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to straighten up. And you don't know. Not only do you not know the day of your death, but you don't know the day when you cross your spiritual deadline and God says, you know what? That's it. You have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ enough, and I'm done. You've had all these opportunities, time after time, dozens and hundreds of opportunities. And dozens and hundreds of times, you put my son in your scale, and you said, not for me. He's not enough. No thanks. And there comes a point, there's a deadline out there, your spiritual deadline, where God says, that's it. You're, you're the walking dead now. You're spiritually dead and always will be. Eventually, you'll be physically dead as well. And all the crying and begging and, and, and repenting will make a, don't make any difference because God says you had your opportunities and you said no. So for Belshazzar, there's no offer of repentance. There's no offer of forgiveness from God. There's no grace, no mercy. The days of grace and mercy have run out. And now he's left with the judgment of God. He died lost in his sins without an opportunity to make it right. And God refused to hear it. I am very glad that God finally got through to me before I crossed my deadline. You know it? I'm so happy. Because there are many, many, many hundreds. I did the math. A thousand times. That's not exactly a thousand times. I put Jesus in my little scale. And God says, you need to come to Christ. You need to be saved. You need to be forgiven. You need to become a child of God. You think you're good? You're not good enough. Because good enough isn't good enough. You can't be. You can't measure up. The gold standard of God is Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter how good a person you are compared to other people. How do you measure up to Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God? You need Jesus. You're pathetically short. You don't measure up. You do not have what it takes. You're dead. You have no life. You got to come to Christ. And a thousand times I said, no, nope, not for me. None now. Maybe someday. Or I'm a pretty good. It's excuse after excuse after excuse. But underneath it all is because I am in it for me. Self-importance. Self-honoring. And God has forgiven me. And here's old Daniel. Daniel's like, you know what? Keep your gold. Keep your robe. Oh, keep your place in this. And keep your, keep your position you're going to give me because by this time tomorrow, it won't even be there. But I'll just do what God tells me to do. I'll say his word. I'll do my thing. I'll respect the authority that's over me, whether it's good or bad. I'll live for my God no matter what. And Daniel survives the overthrow of Babylon. He survives in one kingdom. He survives in the next kingdom. And he's just like untouchable. You know why? Because he was a humble servant of God. And the spirit of God was upon him. And he served, the God, he served God and God only. And that's why. And the Lord blessed him even though he was a thousand miles from his homeland. Now, God puts you and me in his balance. And God puts you in the balance, and he says to you, you don't measure up. I'm sorry, but you don't. You're found wanting. You come up short. But then, God, by the grace and the mercy of God, he also places on your side of the scale 
the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the only begotten Son of God. And he puts the glory of heaven, the heart of heaven, Jesus Christ, your Savior, he puts that on your side of the scale too. And all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has and all that he's accomplished and his holiness and his righteousness and his glory, all that goes on your side of the scale too. Amen? Oh, do you come up short now? Absolutely not. Oh, my judgment day, and I'll have one. Will I come up short? Absolutely not. God put me over on, his, on my side of the scale. That's fine because I ain't going over there without Jesus. Amen? And it's because of the grace and mercy and love and might and power and glory of my God, my Savior, my friend, my Redeemer. Because of that, on judgment day, I have nothing to fear. Amen? That's what it means to be a Christian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we dwell in the days of grace and mercy. Lord, thank you for being patient and kind with us. We know some of us took a long, long time to come around and take Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. Lord, we also know this not, it, it isn't so for so many in this world. We pray, Lord God, that because you're gracious and merciful, Lord, that you'll poke and prod in the hearts and souls and minds of those who are away from you, Lord, that they might know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, this may be the day they humble themselves before you and take all that you've done for them and all that you are and accept the Lord as, uh, as their God, as their King, as their Lord, as their Master, as their Savior. This is our prayer, O oh Lord. And dear Lord Jesus, also for those of us who love you, we'll be the first to admit we don't love you well enough. We want to be better at keeping that first commandment. We want to be people who are more holy in your blessed eyes. We want to take the holy things of God and honor you with it and not honor ourselves. So, Lord, help us to get leverage on ourselves and to overcome these besetting sins and to have the victory that can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we, we place ourselves, our hearts, and all that we have in your holy hands this day. We realize, Lord, that our breath rests in your hands, our times rest in your hands, that you're still, to this very day, almighty, eternal, infinite God. We wouldn't have it any other way. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' magnificent and holy name we pray. Amen.